All right. Um, so welcome everyone again. So glad to see um, so many people here. Um, my name is Zach Sadiq. I'm the Disability Systems Navigation Coordinator over at the Arc of King County. I'm also autistic. I'm a social worker, a community activist, and a community organizer. And one of my, you know, main, you know, drives is to really increase the input of autistic people in all like matters and areas and organizations that impact us and you know, research definitely in a lot of ways has a big impact on our lives, um, even if it's not necessarily the most tangible um, or tangible way. Um, so yeah, today we're here to talk about, um, you know, how the autistic community views autism research. I'll, you know, first start off by saying the autistic community isn't necessarily a monolith. Like, like any group of people, you'll find many different, um, perspectives and ideas and um, points of view. So, you know, we'll be representing our own opinions, but since we're all um, connected to other autistic people in various ways, we can all, we'll, we'll also be talking about, you know, sort of like what we've heard from other autistic folks and sort of like the general attitude of the uh, community as well. Cool. Oh, and um, before I forget, I should give a visual description of myself. Um, so I am a 31-year-old uh, white autistic dude with um, a buzzed haircut, a um, apocalyptically large beard, and I'm wearing a um, red t-shirt that says um, militant inclusionist. I just got muted there, weird. Um, anyway, so I guess let's have the panelists introduce themselves since y'all aren't here to just listen to me. So um, Alyssa, do you wanna go first? Sure. My name is Alyssa. I recently completed a PhD in interdisciplinary neuroscience at the University of Rhode Island. Some of my research is autism related, some is not. My current autism related research mostly relates to either um, autism and queerness so queer autistic people, trans autistic people, or augmentative and alternative communication. Um, image description, I am a white person with glasses and hair tied back, red t-shirt, blurred background. Awesome, thank you so much, Elisa. Um, KM, what about you? <clears throat> Hi, um, so I go by KM and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a year two undergraduate studying psychology and I wish to pursue um, a career in research um, in neuroscience with a specialization in autism spectrum disorders or in mood disorders. Um, I am autistic and mm, I've just recently been involved in um, autism research as a research assistant um, uh, in uh, one of McGill University's um, labs. So that's about it for now. And I am a black person. Um, I wear glasses. Um, I have, I don't know, I'm wearing a blue and white dress and um, there's a background, like a blurred background behind me. Awesome. Thank you so much, KM. Um, Elizabeth, what about you? Hi, I'm uh, Elizabeth Fulmer. I am a faculty member at University of Washington Bothell in the business school, and I have been doing research in this area for less than a year at this point. I'm relatively new to it, but my primary interest is on uh, research relating to autism and work. My um, looking at most of the research I've seen that covers those covers that part of autistic life uh, tends to be about how corporations can either tolerate or exploit autistic people. And I'm looking for, I, I want to produce research that says how to help autistic people thrive and how to um, help autistic people feel welcome and comfortable at work. And so it's a different, that's a little bit of a different take on it. Um, visual description, I am a white lady with glasses. 
um, a blue hoodie and brown hair, blurred background. Awesome. She heard. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And last but not least, we have um, Morgan. Hi. Hey, um, so I, I recently finished an MSW degree at Portland State. And um, in the future, I really want to do a PhD in social work um, research. Um, my area like, that I'm like really, really interested in is looking at stuff relating to autistic sexuality um, with a focus on pleasure as a way of preventing violence against autistic people by centering what people actually do like. Um, and um, I've actually been planning to do a study on um, autistic experiences of, of sexual pleasure with a, a friend of mine um, when we both have the spoons to um, do that in our spare time. Um, I'm also currently getting to work on uh, a literature review of um, everything that's currently been done on autistic sexuality and gender and reproductive health. And um, it's really interesting noticing um, the sort of things that appear even just looking at the abstracts of the articles without even reading them like where some of like the huge gaps are and um one of the things that really um infuriates me is how much of the conversation on that is led by um people who like like it's not really their own identities that are at stake there like when it's a lot of cisgender, um, non-autistic people debating about whether or not um, autistic people can be trans or not. Um, and so, so much of the research is about like controlling and preventing autistic expressions of sexuality. It's just really infuriating to me. Um, so yeah, that's kind of one of the things I'm working on now. Um, and I guess a visual description of myself. I'm a white person, I'm 33, but people tell me that I look younger because like, like a lot of autistic people, I have a skin condition that um, makes my skin look younger um, and gives me chronic pain. But um, my head is shaved on one side and I, I have brown hair. Um, I'm wearing earrings and a lavender button up shirt and I'm also holding a purple um, weighted stuffed animal. Awesome. Thank you, Morgan. Um, yeah, so we have, as y'all can tell, we have a really great um, group of folks here um, with a lot of amazing knowledge, and I'm really eager to just dive in and explore, um, you know, some of your thoughts and ideas. Before I do that, um, you know, I, I should also point out that it is always very important to um, make sure, like as many other, like, intersecting identities, um, that connect to autism can be included as possible. And we are, you know, missing someone who is a non-speaker. And we're also, you know, missing someone who um, has an intellectual disability. So that um, definitely, you know, I'll say that impacts our points of view and our experiences with, you know, everything from accessibility, um, you know, to like ease of access. And I think it's definitely important to, you know, point that out as much as possible. Um, oh, and uh, before I jump into the next question, I should also talk a little about my experience with research. So um, I'm, I'm a social worker and, you know, during my practicum and now as a fully fledged social worker, I've participated on about four different research advisory boards um, related to autism research, everything from like autism and health disparities, autism and education, um, to um, looking at like, what does a good life mean for autistic adults, which has turned out to be a really complicated question with many complicated answers. Um, so yeah, let's jump into the uh, next question. And um, so let's start by uh, talking about the different values and philosophies that exist both within the autistic community and the research community. I know, you know, like generalized statements about like what one group or the other group might think aren't necessarily 100% accurate, but I do think it is fair to say that there's certain like trends or paradigms in how, um, you know, certain communities view, you know, like what legitimate research might look like or, you know, what valid data might look like, for example. And, you know, I think it's also important to talk about like how do those sort of like differences in values um, and philosophies like impact autism research? Like how does it, you know, promote 
certain points of view or leave out certain points of view? You know, how does it impact our discussion here today? Um, Alyssa, do you want to start us off? Oh, you're muted, by the way. Okay, now that I am not muted, I can do that. So one thing that I have noticed in the research world is that there is often a desire to quantify deficits and to connect things to deficits. The example that I would give for that is there was a recent study recent within the past couple of years in which they asked people to either choose between receiving money but an organization that they would consider immoral gets money as well or donations to charity, that sort of thing. I don't remember the methods in detail, but you did this either publicly or privately. Autistic people were more consistent about whether or not they were more consistent between public and private, which meant that specifically in the case of receiving money, but so does an immoral organization in private, so other people do not know about this, would be unlikely to know about this decision, autistic people were more likely to refuse. This was interpreted by the researchers as a theory of mind deficit. Excuse me, on what planet is this a theory of mind deficit? How are you coming up with this? I read the paper. I read their argument. I still don't understand why they think this is a theory of mind deficit. So that would be my statement on strong desire to link things to deficits. I think I've said enough words for now. So someone else can take autistic priorities and I'm sure that other people have observations on researchers too. You know, I was going to bring up that exact same example, and I could t I could tell that's the one that was coming. And yeah, I I was just so surprised. I I shouldn't be surprised, but <laughs> I was. Um, KM, what are you thinking? I'm, I'm curious, like, what the arguments were for suggesting this was a theory of mind deficit. To tell you for certain I'd have to dig up the paper. I can do that. I can stick the link in the chat so anyone who wants to see it can. Sure, I'd be interested. Um, in regards like, to the question, I mainly focus on um, you know, values and principles, ideologies um, that were more or less um, unanimous within the autistic community. I don't know if that um, responds well to the question. Okay. It totally um, does, yeah. Yeah, so um, just like in terms, like in, when it comes to research, um, there is al always the, oftentimes it is viewed and conceived um, through the medical model um, of disabilities and not uh, the social model. So I think also that does definitely feed her, you know, deficit-based conception of autism that has completely defined um, autism and autism research since, thank you very much, Simon Baron Cohen's 1990s um, studies. And we have yet to um, actually go into a paradigm shift and shift our research um, just lens and how we conduct research and the results we expect um, to have, well, to not expect any results because our whole conception of autism in the research world has just been very neurotypical, ableist. Um, so I think that also feeds into the deficit-based, impairment-based conception of autism, um, as well as just 
um, having only neurotypical um, neurotypical studying research, or at least their voices being louder than that of neurodivergent or autistic uh, researchers, and the limitations of acknowledgement of their own lack of empathy, their own lack of willingness to understand autistic individuals, um, and just the whole double empathy problem um, that it's quite funny, but oftentimes if the majority is something and a minority is not, then they must be the anomaly. They must be, you know, the pathological, weird, marginalized population and we're doing it right. Um, but, you know, obviously there is a need to reconsider um, this kind of healthy norm um, that is to be neurotypical and the way um, autism is led, as well, uh, autism research is led. Um, okay, in the community, there also is, um, like there is a consensus in a way in terms of using diagnostic labels and levels um, versus autism spectrum <laughs> versus not using them. So just referring to people as autistic, not a particular diagnosis. Um, a diagnosis, um, which does not really fall in line with um, how research is conducted nowadays. But I'm also not, um, like it may be a consensus. And if you speak out against this, it can be very like, it can get very chaotic, but I'm also not um, necessarily um, convinced by the use of a three letter like abbreviation instead of specific. Um, diagnoses, and also um, I you need to point like I'd like to point out how we forget about black and brown autistic lives, and I just despise the word person of color, so I will not be using the word person of color. But black and brown will refer to non-white individuals, um, and the very many um, barriers faced by ethnic min minorities. Um, but also the lack of acknowledgement coming from white or Caucasian individuals. Yeah, thank you so much, KM. I absolutely agree with everything you said there. And I, yeah, I've um, also noticed that like lack of um, focus on the experiences of, um, you know, black and brown autistic folks, you know, so often. Um, you know, that like y'all aren't represented in the research. And I think it, you know, perpetuates so many existing forms of oppression. So glad mm -hmm. you brought that up. Um, Elizabeth, uh, what about you? I'm not sure if I have quite as much to say as, as your other two panelists so far. Um, that study, Alyssa, that you described is pretty infuriating. And um, interesting that, like, I can't, like, the idea of calling that a theory of mind issue is almost funny to me that it's because it's so absurd. It's more like a like an honesty or like an interest in reality kind of issue. It's very strange. Um, yeah, um, seems more like a neurotypical truth deficit than yeah anything else. Um, I think that my perspective on the whole autistic community versus research community and what they have in mind question is, I think that there are still vast underestimates of how big the autistic community really is. Um, I think there are a lot of us, um, me included, who figured it out much later in life and struggled through work. Like I, I struggled at work for decades, not knowing that the fact that I'm um, very likely autistic is affecting how I work. And I think that just the underestimation of the, the size of the population is a big factor here. Um, and there's also, I think, much too little aware, awareness of the variance within the autistic community, their variety, the different experiences and capabilities and um, perceptions that are in that community. It's not, you know, one thing like um, that fits a, stereotype. It's lots and lots of different kinds of experiences. And I think that's something that's still um, not really apparent to most people in research. 
Yeah, we're definitely a box of chocolate in a lot of ways. <laughs> um, awesome. So M Morgan, uh, what are you thinking? Uh, yeah, first, I definitely want to ag agree with Cam that that's something I've seen in, in terms of looking at, at the research that um, there's very, very, very little um, addressing um, intersections with, 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 with race. And um, yeah, that it seems like a really glaring gap and where like, research is just not um, addressing that. Um, I feel like something I would say in terms of um, differences of perspective, I think it's really how the problem is defined and that um, like most autistic folks that I talk to about kind of like what they like want like research to do, it's stuff that might kind of like ad address kind of like, like practical problems that like folks are encountering in their lives in terms of um, like, like the, the types of things that feel relevant. It's like, like doing, doing research on some type of like health condition that autistic people like might be more likely to experience. And then maybe it's hard to get treatment for this thing because no doctors know about it and it's not really prioritized. And you have to kind of be your own expert on that sort of thing. I kind of experienced one of those sorts of things myself. Um, and just, I think there's, I, I feel like, but it seems like autistic people's perspectives on this thing, it seems to be a lot more grounded in just sort of the day-to-day -day reality of um, like the hardships of having multiple disabilities and dealing with barriers to care and th that type of thing and the like lack of understanding and, and awareness or even like knowing how to navigate getting like, support and care for these sorts of things. Whereas it seems like a lot of the priorities that I see with like non-autistic researchers, the the problem is oftentimes sort of there's this sort of weird logic thing where like because somebody is disabled that therefore like the disability itself sort of like means that they are the problem. Um, and that, of course, if, if they do anything weird, that then there's a, a lot of this like pathologization that goes into that. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of that, but um, just thinking of all the the research on like autistic sexuality, so much of it is just focused on um, like how to normalize and um, make big people so that they're not like a a bother and a problem for other folks rather than trying to address stuff at um, kind of how at, a, at an individual level and how people are experiencing their sexuality. I hope that that makes sense. Um, it's sort of like who's defining the problem. And I think as a social worker, that to me is really glaring because there's a huge power issue there in terms of like who is getting to decide the priorities. Yeah. Oh, I completely agree with where you're coming from there. I was um, recently reading a paper by a prominent um, autistic researcher, you know, just talking about how essentially objectivity is seen in a lot of research circles is only existing within the non-autistic people. You know, if we're autistic, experiencing these things and then, you know, bringing them into the research we do, like it means we're biased and oftentimes that, you know, completely washes over like, you know, the, the values that the researchers are bringing, you know, what they've learned in their own lives, what they've learned about disability, how they've been socialized. And that I don't think is often acknowledged in, you know, how the research is done, like in how the data is, you know, collected and what data is even seen as like meaningful and valuable. And, you know, tying it back to, I think it was um, Alyssa or maybe KM who brought up like the medical versus social model of disabilities. I think that right there for me is like really the key at where the um, difference in values lie. You know, I've traditionally seen, um, you know, the majority of research that's coming out as seeing autism through a very pathologizing lens, lens is very similar to something like cancer or diabetes or something like a disease that might kill us. And that leads to very deficit-based language and the idea that like autism is something that needs to be cured or eliminated like cancer or diabetes. And 
you know, like traditionally autistic people haven't really been seen as stakeholders in autism research. You know, we haven't been seen as a distinct group of people, a collective group of people with our own ideas and desires, including in how research should be done. And I think that right there has created a lot of tension and, um, you know, some of the hostility that researchers might see from autistic people when they um, might say or do certain things. And, you know, that actually leads us into our next question. So thinking about, um, you know, like pretty much the main reason why I decided to do this panel. Um, mm -hmm. Most of, mm -hmm. oh, go, yeah. Is, is um, can I say, like, can I bounce back off? What, oh, please okay. do, please do, yeah. Um, I was also like, um, in addition to what, or more bouncing off what Elizabeth said, um, there is so little focus on adult autistics um, and like adult and, older autistics as well, which is a great deficit in itself. Um, I there I think there is enough like a reprising of research um, in terms of like at least queer and autistic matters. I think so. Um, you could correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I feel um, also correct me if I'm wrong. One like some very like beautiful thing I've seen is that the autistic community very early on was very welcoming of queer people um, and yeah but um, I want to say that also research because it is you know economically driven it is financially driven the like the, the finding interventions and treatment for children is because autism is such a drain on a country's econ economy that's why that as early as they can eradicate it, then they're, they do not have to you know, spend part of their budget on these children who somewhat somehow just disappear into non-autistic adults, whatever. Um, but it's, I think it's very, very like financially driven as well, which is why adults don't get as much attention, which is why minorities certainly won't get as much attention um, and so on and so forth. And this is something that's very real in the research world, whatever the topic is. So I, I don't know how like it can be circumnavigated, but yeah. That is such an important point right there. Like so much of this is economically driven and you know, I feel like the research world has stuck to the idea that like, if you, you know, intervene on us early enough, like you say, okay, um, maybe it'll remove our autism as adults. But what it, I've seen it do, at least to my generation of autistic folks is it just teaches us to mask and hide our autistic traits, no matter like the pain um, and, you know, like thoughts of suicide it might cause in some of us and the fact that the research isn't looking at you know what's happening at adults it's missing like so many crises and you know like it's like one thing I've noticed that really encapsulates this is that there are as of like three months ago when I looked literally more studies on how um, broccoli impacts autistic people's social skills versus if you combined like the research on autism and homelessness and autism and domestic violence, both of which are like huge crises went for autistic adults. Um, and technically it's sulfide, which is like a big component of broccoli, but one of the studies actually was just feeding them broccoli. And I'm just like, this got like how much in funding versus, oh yeah, I, I, I'll, go on about this for hours. So I'm going to jump to the next question, unless any of y'all have anything else to add. Okay, cool. So, you know, one of the main reasons why um, I wanted to put together this webinar was because of Spectrum 10K. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Spectrum 10K, um, it was to be the largest ever autism um, you know, research project in the United Kingdom. It was um, going to be led by um, Simon Baron Cohen. I think that's the right Baron Cohen. I get him and his uh, cousin mixed up sometimes. Um, and it was, yeah, so three million pounds. Um, and, you know, from what I understand, the goal was to study um, sort of like the genetic and environmental factors that might contribute to autism um, and other like common co-occurring conditions that might impact us. 
And like this set off some really giant um, like protests amongst the autistic community, like more so than usual. Like the people even showed up to in-person protests, which almost never happens with the amount of um, autistic people who actually showed up. So it was, it was a big deal. And um, what actually really surprised me is that, um, you know, uh, Simon Baron Cohen put the study on pause to, um, you know, quote, co-design and conduct a meaningful consultation with autistic people and their families and how to incorporate their suggestions to improve Spectrum 10K. Like, I, I was shocked that that happens. Like, you know, we autistic people have protested against certain types of research for years and something like this has never happened. Um, so really felt like a big watershed moment. Um, and so I guess my questions for y'all are like, how is the stu- why was the study controversial in the autistic community? You know, how does it sort of like reflect the difference in values um, earlier? And like, what should every, you know, the audience members here learn from this? Um, let's go backwards. So Morgan, you're up. Yeah, so I think um, there were a lot of concerns over um, how materials were written and in terms of um, usage of genetic data and um, how that might be used in the future that, that there's a lot of concern about transparency there um, and just in terms of how the study was written. Um, and a lot of concerns about how that might be connected with eugenics and, and genetic stuff. Um, I can, can you um, talk a little about what is eugenics? Oh yes, yes. So um, for anyone who's not familiar, like e- eugenics refers to um, it was I think coined in the late um, 19th century um, by that Francis um, Dalton. Um, Anyway, um, it refers to the idea that um, there's certain there's a, there's a lot of like overlap with like white supremacy and other kind of forms of oppression, but um, this it refers to this idea that um, there's certain classes of people that um, the society wants to have more children, and that um, certain um, categories of people, including disabled people, that um, that are not supposed to reproduce because you don't want to have more of them. And it's really, um, it, it manifests in many different ways, but um, one of them is, um, I think there's there's been a lot of kind of like concern about how, um, I think it's in Iceland where there's almost no folks with Down syndrome, for instance, because um, there's like a very effective like prenatal test for that. Um, and so there's, I think, a lot of concern around um, like research that emphasizes um, sort of looking for like genetic markers of autism for that reason. So that, that's always kind of like a, a really like sensitive topic for that reason. Yeah, I definitely share your points of view there in a lot of ways. Um, Elizabeth, do you have anything to add? Um, I think Morgan covered the the main points, the the eugenics angle. That's most of what I know about about this um, particular thing. I think um, it's just it's. I, I laugh when I I hear the news that that Baron Cohen is gonna oh I, I'll I'll go consult with the autistic community and we'll fix it and we'll we'll move ahead. But like from the very beginning, from the ground up, the question was how do we fix it. Um, and I think that's, you know, they kind of went wrong when they opened their eyes that morning. Um, it's like, it's, it's more about reframing the question and re-understanding, um, what could be learned. Um, yeah. Definitely important. Um, KM, do you have anything you want to add? I'm going to let Lisa go for uh Lisa go first, <laughs> because otherwise I'm going to mon- monopolize the conversation. All right. Um, So first thing I'm going to go with is eugenics has already been said. Also, Simon Baron Cohen had already (laughs) spent all of his ability to be trusted because extreme male brain theory and the end theory of mind. Like, this is not going to be very nice of me, but 
if Simon Baron Cohen is the one framing it, that was your first mistake. Stop letting him frame autism shit. <laughs> we have established that he cannot do it effect, that he cannot do it without doing a whole lot of damage. And that his theories aren't even like they're empirically bad and have bad impacts. Can he not? Also, with the in-person protests, he stated, and I believe this was to a, I don't remember if she was black or brown, black. but to black, thank you, to a black autistic, I think woman, related to the protests, he claimed that there would be police presence at the protest, including police dogs. Considering is what, how police, autism, and race intersect, that's a threat of violence. So that would be a case of Simon Baron Cohen, upon discovering that he is in a hole, continuing to dig. I yeah. Even, yeah, I didn't even hear about that. That's, oh. So, okay, I'm ready to uh, tell everyone everything that any of us missed. <laughs> uh, yes, but please interrupt me, or maybe I'll go one by one, because I've compiled a list, because thank you, Monotropic Mind, um, and we could discuss those, if ever. Um, so we did talk about any fear of the eugenic purposes, so that's good. Um, also, the one of one of the concerns that the autistic community had is that one of the co-leads used to be part of Cure Autism Now, which is very suspect and like, yeah, um, red flag. Um, also, and um, okay, so this is more in, like. I've worked off in terms of my opinion, a lot of the letter of information itself. So what the participants receive and if they have an interest in participating. And of course I have read other, um, like, like what others opinions on this subject. And just to make it kind of quick, um, the consent firm first and foremost is not tailored to the population it targets because just the, the language isn't simple enough to be understood and to have like to actually give informed consent in the sense that you know exactly what you're going into, what it entails, what it means for your DNA, what it means for how much time you have to put in, et cetera, et cetera. It, it completely fails to do so. It does not provide positions and mirrors to many, many aspects regarding data storage and confidentiality making informed consent just impossible. Okay, so one or two examples I do have is the fact that they say DNA will be kept, your DNA will be stored long-term. And they also say um, data from these records, your medical records will be shared with the Spectrum 10K research team and stored long-term. I have never seen a letter of information of consent form with such little detail in terms to what long-term means. What, what are you talking about? Years, months, my medical records? What about my medical records? Where do I consent to this? Like, where do I give my consent or take away my consent from having this done? Um, who is your Spectrum 10K research team? And also they do allow for future, for your data to be used for future research studies. No names, um, no purposes mentioned, um, nothing, nothing. They don't, they don't even tell you the extent of your data that can be used. If it is your anonymized um, data, where in you know, all these steps you can consent to it or not consent, because things like these are absolutely up to like voluntarily consenting to such a thing. And you're like, I feel also, like that's also the point I was gonna make um, at some point. Um, there are very few alternatives in terms of being able to consent um, to the different requests, namely to like, re they're requesting your uh, medical records. Um, they may have access to your, they do have 
access to your hospitalizations, um, your diagnoses, even your blood tests. Like this is really written in the letter of information. Um, and, you know, who knows, like, to what extent are possible potential participants aware of this? Um, also, uh, I feel it skews volition in that, and this is a huge, huge, huge red flag. Once you've, once they collect your data, you can withdraw from the study, but data previously collected from your participation remains with them. Like that is very, like I have, I, I, I've not been involved in research that long, so correct me if I'm wrong, but there is always, always, always should be, in terms of eth ethics, a possibility to completely erase a person's data. They're saying, okay, well, you gave your saliva. You don't want us to use new data from you. Okay, then, but you know, whatever you gave already, we're gonna use. They say it is, and I'm just gonna quote them on this, why they, they cannot erase your data. It would not be possible to remove data from research that had already taken place. In what world in 2021 are you unable to remove data from research that has already taken place? Even now, as they are consulting, co-consulting, co-whatever, co-producing, um, the data they've already collected stays with them. They're not analyzing it for genetic purposes or genetic analysis, analysis um, but they are keeping it. And the thing is, the funny thing is that once it's been modified, et cetera, those who gave consent to this original letter of information, this form, consent form, what happens to their consent form, like to their consent, is it nullified? Is it still fine? Or are they going to go through it? Um, so I'm just going to pause here and let you guys um, just if you have anything to say. I'm just reminded of, um, I don't know if, if any of you in the audience um, are not familiar with um, Henrietta Lacks. Um, the, I, I believe the, 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 short, the short story of that is that she had um, cancer and that, oh, yeah. And like, yeah, yeah, like her, her cancer cells were kind of like taken without like her consent and used in like cancer treatments. But I mean, like this is like, like that, that is like one of the reasons why we like have like so many like protections around like use of people's um, genetic material and like why like consent for like donating material and like knowing like what happens to it, why that's so important. Um, yeah, I definitely appreciate that info dump KM. I, I think going over like specifically like what you know, people found objectionable is really useful. And, you know, hopefully, you know, hearing this, um, it can spark some change in, you know, similar autism research studies in the US with, um, you know, similar goals and aims. Um, yeah, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to take us take us a little off the plan course here, but so much of this just comes down to the idea of, like finding a cure for autism, you know, oftentimes when we, you know, autistic people advocate against cures, you know, the responses we might get is, um, oh, well, essentially we're too high functioning to really have a say in this matter. Um, or, you know, it, you know, like cures can exist and it'll be up to, you know, autistic people like to take them or not. And I'm wondering like, what's all of your stances on like, you know, finding a cure for autism. Is that where the research should be going? Um, or, you know, should something different be happening? We, regardless of the ethics of curing autism, which is its whole own mess, and I absolutely do not believe anyone who says it will be the choice of the autistic person because it is going, because there's this legal construct called childhood that exists in which parents. But, um... 
And I think it's also really important to know, like autism is like one of the few minority groups where like the parents don't necessarily share the same identity. And so, you know, the socialization they've received might be very negative about autism or disability. But regardless of that, I just finished my PhD in neuroscience. We do not understand human nervous systems anywhere near well enough mm -hmm. for the concept of curing autism as a thing that you are going to do to lead to me doing anything other than on a scientific level, laughing you out of the room on top of any ethical issues that there are, which are worse. Like that this is not a thing you're doing. Cure, like make, taking autistic people and turning them into non-autistic people is not a thing you're doing. Therefore, tell me what you're really doing and we can discuss the issues with that. <laughs> totally. Yeah, that's super important. Morgan, it looks like you have something to add there. Yeah, I think to me, one of the ethical things that comes up when I guess when disability services are kind of centered around um, like curing autism in that way. Um, I know um, in some places where there's um, like where euthanasia is kind of like practiced, um, it sometimes is sort of just framed as something that is like that you do as kind of like a, a disability intervention that might be actually the, like if, if other kinds of services are not available, that might be something that is that is there and is cheaper and is really horrible. And, um, but to me, that's something I think about is um, just the, the way that disability is framed in terms of, um, what what caring means because I think that in, in some contexts it kind of like when when it's seen that that um, the funding shouldn't go into kind of like, like um, supporting an individual in like living their life as a disabled person that then you have like kind of like this is kind of like treated as sort of like the most like efficient alternative um, so I, I hope that kind of like makes sense but um, I kind of been seeing like articles about that coming up and so something I've been thinking about for a while. Awesome, thank you. I had a computer problem there, so I missed like the middle of what you said, but I'm sure whatever it was, it was um, great. Um, let's see, KM or Elizabeth, do y'all have anything to add to this before I jump in? Elizabeth, go ahead. I think I think they've covered it. I'm so glad that you had a, um, a neuroscientist on the on the panel to address the you're not going to do that question, which was kind of my slightly less informed um, response to that. But. Awesome. Yeah. So I I don't know if this has been said already. Um, like I can definitely understand like why some folks would want to find a cure. Like there is not enough understanding um, for how to properly support autistic people. You know, even those who don't necessarily have as high support needs as, um, you know, other autistic folks. And, you know, for a lot of autistic folks, like their lives are hell because of it. And I think that it's unfair to put that burden of change solely on the autistic person. Like that happens to autistic people of any, um, you know, any support level. And by that just, you know, what the research now shows is directly leads to, um, you know, depression, suicidal ideation and anxiety. And, you know, I think for, you know, autistic folks with higher support needs, the biggest problem is the lack of supports. Like it is much easier to blame your kid for, having three meltdowns in an hour versus um, blaming the fact that, say, Washington State is 41st out of 50th in developmental disability funding per capita, and the state just isn't providing enough um, resources and support, you know, to be able to, you know, help support folks in that way. And, you know, I, I think Melissa, um, you know, covered this a little earlier. It's, 
it's not going to be the autistic people making the decision on whether or not they'd be cured of their autism. It's going to be the parents. And I think that, um, like, there's a huge power disparity there um, that needs to be acknowledged and isn't being acknowledged. And I know, like, you know, one piece of pushback, you know, we might get is, hey, you know, economically, you know, there's just not enough support um, to be able to, you know, provide autistic people the supports needed to you know, do what they want to in life. And I'm just sitting here thinking like, you know, at least in Washington state, the money does exist. Like, you know, if we had an income tax in my, you know, humble opinion, things would, it would be a lot easier to support, you know, autistic folks and folks with disabilities. And so I think, you know, I think that's one aspect that definitely concerns me. And then another thing is just, you know, the fact that um, I, I haven't seen the most recent funding, um, breakdowns, but it's something like 60% of research is spent towards like under, you know, the biological causes of autism. And so that just leads to the disparities in um, looking at like, what are adults going through? Um, you know, like, what is the autistic experience with, um, you know, domestic violence or homelessness? You know, like, how is the special education to prison pipeline, you know, contributing to the mass incarceration of, you know, Black autistic men? for example, there's a lot. And I think, you know, the assumption seems to be like, if we're cured, then like, none of that's going to matter ultimately. And it doesn't seem like a cures would are ever going to happen. And, you know, I think diversity is what makes human life wonderful, you know, like without deaf people, we wouldn't have text messaging without, um, you know, people with um, physical disabilities, we wouldn't have elevators, you know, without autistic people, we probably wouldn't have, um, you know, computers or many other wonderful things. So, you know, I think it's important to look at what we can bring in addition to, um, you know, like whatever the economic cost might be, you know, human lives shouldn't be measured solely by what we can contribute or take away from the economy. And that's a standard that only exists for disabled people, it seems like. Yeah, so I, I, I can rant about this for two hours. I literally have presentations where I rant about this for two hours, so I'm not going <laughs> to get into that now. But if, you know, you're interested in bringing this rant to your organization, like, let me know and we can definitely talk about that. Um, so I'm going to jump into the next question, um, which is what's going, you know, when going through the news reports about Spectrum 10K, I found the following quote. Um, the responses from the autistic community, though in some ways helpful, could discourage young scientists from wading into autism research, says X from an associate professor from a university in, you know, somewhere else. Um, they might also thwart ongoing treatment studies and future investments in genetic research, others say. Um, that, that quote hit me in a lot of ways, but, and before I, you know, go on about that. How did that quote hit you all? Elisa, you seem like you, you're you the one who has like the most ready to burst. So I think you should go first. If this is the kind of study that those young scientists wanted to do, good. Um, like, honestly, if studies like Spectrum 10K are what gets thwarted, I'm fine with that. And considering what the vast majority of autism research looks like, I think that's what's going to get thwarted. If, they're, if they are not completely full of shit, the research that would get thwarted is stuff that I'm fine with losing. Morgan. Yeah, I agree 100% with all of that. Um, I think, I think, and kind of like when I, I reflected on that quote um, a lot um, recently, and one of the things that I feel like it reminds me of um, when someone says that, um, I, I forget exactly how that is usually phrased, but um, like when you criticize someone and um, then they say, oh, well, you'll turn um, allies away if you say stuff like that. I mean, 
you're not really an ally if you are doing this sort of thing. And so I think kind of in, in the same sense, I think um, like, exactly right like I don't know that we want more research like that um and I I also think that it's creating kind of a false dichotomy between having to choose between mm -hmm. really bad harmful research um and scaring away potential researchers and I don't I don't know that we should have such low expectations of future researchers and like assume that they can't do better because I I, I think that that we can. I think that when there is a standard that they know that they will be held to, that I think that they can do better. Hey, Amir Elizabeth, do y'all have anything to add? It's a really weird threat. And it, especially coming from somebody who's an associate professor, which means they've been in academia for at least a decade at this point. Like there's always something new that complicates research all the time and having an interested population that cares what questions you're asking and whether you're doing it ethically is the least of your problems, frankly. Um, and if that's something that you're going to bother to object to, you obviously have motives that should be questioned. Like, why wouldn't someone receive that feedback from the community being addressed? with open arms, it's sort of bonkers to me. I don't, I don't get it. And to me, like this points to just like how radically, like how much we need to change the paradigm through which we look at autism, research autism. Um, just like, you know, mentioning the double empathy problem, just also like I did read a, an article um, whilst, um, during my research assistantship. And that kind of completely reshaped the view, the way I view autism research. And it was um, failing, empirical failures to prove um, that autistics lack theory of mind. And if I can like um, suggest anything to read, it's any actual recent um, scientifically accurate um, literature and the studies that have been done to prove that autistic, for instance, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication is very effective. Um, that also not proves, but um, has like shows in a way, or that shows that neurotypicals, which is a fact, are generally less willing to befriend autistics and to communicate with autistics. And just the whole way we've, it, there needs to be a pro profound shift because this, you know, associate professor um, is hearing the the feedback that autistics and many of whom are very much involved in research are educated and bright people who responded to this whole Spectrum 10K um, thing through, you know, and open letters, um, articles, podcasts, YouTube videos, like they have been very generous in terms of information and um, that is concerning information that needs to be added, the deficits of the study itself. And to respond in that way means you truly cannot envision a newer, more accurate way um, of understanding autism in the research world, in the scientific world, which just means like, I don't want the young scientists and I myself am 21 and still an, under, an undergrad. So us, we should be pointed towards this kind of literature, this type of studies. And of course, like, uh, you know, participatory studies. Like when I was in the, in the lab this summer, I was like, if I think that the best thing would be to have at least one autistic consultant for every study done about autism because there are so many knowledgeable people on social media who like autistics who know about autistic uh, autism who study autism and who can like spectrum 10k wouldn't have had this many problems if they consulted beforehand with autistics and i don't know how like they haven't consulted with autistics up to this point, but yeah. But also like one thing they also um, like, it's all right if genetic studies and genetic testing of autism doesn't like um, evolve or doesn't increase because the worry or the first, the priority for autistics and their families is not 
what caused my autism is not the biological makeup uh, of like the origins of autism anyway. And also that is a failure when it comes to research and that, like you said, I think 60% in some places, 40% in others, but just like a huge chunk um, is dedicated to what in the brain causes autism and we're gonna undo that. We're gonna find a way to just, yeah. Right, and compared to the fact that like, you know, I think it was the 2017, you know, US autism research budget, only 2% was spent towards um, like lifespan issues compared to that 60%. So that just disparity right there is so mind boggling. <sighs> Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Cam. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Because you should cut me off because info dumping is a real problem I have. But um, also, and this is this is staggering in 2021. Okay, if we were in 2020, 2016, that's fine. But you have eight autistic individuals, all of whom are white, which is very funny and ironic because the UK has quite a, popu a diverse population, namely people coming from India and Pakistan, okay? And not there is not one Asian person, not one black British person, not one brown British person, nothing. Um, the, there are four parents' families, so duos or families, one mixed couple with one black male, a father of autistic children. There is one trans person, I believe, so I'm not going to take away from that. Um, but also the actual team is a team of all white individuals. No, sorry, nine white individuals, one brown um, individual, Okay. And two problems people have had when it comes to race and also when it comes to intersectionalities, you know, because they're like, where are the actual autistic people with learning disabilities, with medical conditions, namely um, EDS, which has had no um, kind of, which has not been talked about, which has caused many autistics to be like, okay, but other than ADHD and OCD, um, there is EDS, uh, which is, oh, sorry, elder Stanmos syndrome. Um, where are the brown and black and Asian autistics? Where are the, all the autistics, also a lot of the autistics um, who are, what do they call them, ambassadors? Um, are Most of them are were diagnosed late in life, but you need autistics also who were diagnosed early in life, who went through ABA, who know what the traumas of early interventions and who, who, who can like consult and share that lived experience because that's like, of course, you also do need non-speaking autistic autistics who use AAC. What about the Muslim autistics? What about the Jewish autistics? At least just one person who represents some form of spirituality or religious religiousity. Immigrant autistics? No, no. Queer autistics? Okay, there is one trans person, but to be fair, so yeah. Um. Yeah, I think I definitely agree. Like representation is so important. And I do understand like it, you know, for researchers who haven't previously been connected to, you know, the autistic community, it is hard to find that representation. And there is specialized skills that are required to be able to really start that process and find inclusion. And I know very few researchers who have been able to figure all that on their own. So I do realize there are very significant barriers there. And, you know, when those barriers, like not addressing those barriers is like harming autistic people like that, I, you know, I will start to, um, you know, whack my finger a little when I'm seeing that. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm just gonna make. Oh no, no! Info. I love info dumping. I'm just gonna like make one point because there is no compensation for this study, and this is very laughable, ridiculous. You have a three billion pound budget. You wanna, you want, you want autism. Okay, what do you want? You want a DNA sample. You want them to do a sign up questionnaire. You want them to do optional questionnaires, and there is even a coronavirus questionnaire which is longitudinal, every two months for two years and they're not providing compensation. They are not even providing feedback on each participant's um, genetic makeup, each participant's you know, um, questionnaires. They are not, they are, there is no benefit to partic participating in this. Not only is it ambiguous, mm, suspect, um, ethically like, mm, we're not sure about this. Is it like just not precise enough? Is it, but there is no compensation, they're, they're not, thanking you for your time. And by the way, you will never have access to the data that they have 
of you. So they've got my blood test, but they're never gonna share this information with me. And also if they discover that I have whatever genetic disorder, they will not be sharing that with me. They will not be telling you the discoveries they make of your data, of you, to you. No, that they say that once it's submitted to them, that's that's all, like, yeah. And also there is, um, please interrupt me, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, and they say that this is meant for the well-being of autistics, but how is this helping autistics? They literally get nothing out of it. Yeah, yeah, I so much agreeing there. Um, and I, I, oh, Elizabeth, you're raising your hand. Hey, I'm your level of detail on this is is helping me think about it in a more deep in a, more, in a richer way that I, I really appreciate and your comment about the the longitudinal data collection where they're going to be talking to you for two years and there's no compensation like they're not going to get that data nobody's going to show up for that right like it's really hard to get people to fill out two surveys two weeks apart. Um, and you have to pay them to do it so i'm a little worried about what methods of coercion are going to be used to try to get to get that data because volunteers are not going to do that that's just not what people are like exactly and i think at the core of this i'm gonna jump on this really quickly before we um slide to the next question um like i pretty much agree with everything y'all have said like i know it can feel hard to um you know have a sudden paradigm shift and feel like you're getting left behind like i don't want to undersell like that can be hard for folks emotionally but when that paradigm shift is you know bringing more inclusion and more community input like it needs to happen and you know blocking that paradigm shift is go is harmful it's perpetuating the current harm that's happening mm -hmm. and i know it can feel you know like there's a lot of feels that come up when you realize that you might have harmed someone even unintentionally and that definitely does need to be processed and like i and I'm, I'm, I'm going to vent here. Like I've also seen so many, um, just so many professionals, so many researchers, just not, they haven't done that processing and, you know, their lack of learning has like actively contributed to harm. And in some cases has actually killed people out of really, you know, bad medical decisions, really uninformed medical decisions that were made. So there's, there's a huge impact whether or not that person realizes it. Um, and so, you know, when I first read this quote, I was just like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Like, how could someone even think this? Like, you know, I can understand now where that quote was coming from, but, you know, my first impulse was just like, well, if they don't want to listen to autistic people about autism research, then good, they're the problem. They shouldn't be here. You know, there's already enough barriers to autistic people to entering autism research and if there's less autism researchers maybe then there will be more autistic autism researchers but you know i also don't want to discourage people from entering this field as long as they have sort of like the right understanding and right theoretical orientation and realize that you know they're doing research on a distinct group of people with ideas thoughts and wants um and values and when though the research isn't representing any of that and you know might be contributing to harm then like yeah that shouldn't be happening um so yeah I've, i i have a lot of feels over this oh morgan i i see you're raising your hand and since i'm autistic i can't tell the uh, nonverbal signal that you're trying to send sorry that was a joke feel do you have anything to add oh yeah sorry i should have raised my moon pal's hand instead it's bigger than mine um but um, oh, yeah, I think kind of like adding on to like what other folks have said, um, I think when I um, first like read the quote, it feels like they're asking folks in a position of kind of like relative less, less power to coddle and cater to the fragility of individuals who are holding a lot more power over them and and as, as you're saying exactly that, that that research is like really harmed and it has, has killed people and um i think it's important to name that that's what's being asked and um that like just like the the huge power disparity there at bit play and what's going on and um yeah i 
don't think we should, should coddle researchers' fragility. I think if they feel uncomfortable that maybe there's some usefulness in, in that discomfort, so. I agree, like I absolutely don't think we should have to. And you know what I'm finding out unfortunately in this change making work is that at this point we have to because of the power disparity and <laughs> like, that just does so much, like for me emotionally, that's done so much damage. And I know many other autistic change makers and activists who have been burnt out from this work as well in similar ways. Like we shouldn't have to be taking into consideration, you know, the feelings of those in positions of power and their own fragility. And like, it, it's such in a really awful way, just such a great man of, you know, like example of the problems with the autistic service system, like autistic people are being taught to put other people's feelings um, above our own, we're being taught to take care of others emotional needs before our own. And the fact that like in order to, um, you know, change the system, we're having to do the same thing. Oh, yeah, there's a lot I could go on there. Um, and then I think the last thing I'll say before we jump to the final question, um, you know, like there absolutely does need to be autistic people like doing autism research. And it doesn't just start with that. It shouldn't end with that. Like there also has to be organizational policies that are you know, supportive of autistic people that understand those power disparities that exist, that understand the history that exists. Like I've been thrown into so many places where, you know, that are actively ableist and expected to operate in them because that's what everyone has always done without realizing that it is leaving out many of those who, you know, have the most to add. And, you know, I definitely think like organizations to do this work properly need to have like ongoing equity analyses, you know, ongoing diversity, equity and inclusion programs. Like, you know, if they're doing them for like other marginalized groups, like absolutely important and disability also needs to be added to that and autism needs to be added to that. Um, yeah, cool. So in the last 15 minutes, yeah. yeah. Um, does the language strike any of you also as quite condescending and quite even patronizing? I feel like I don't know. It's such a lack of of humility when you are told autistics are telling you what needs to be fixed, and you're just like, well, by doing that, they're going to discourage you. Like I feel it's very condescending, which has almost always been kind of the rhetoric or the way spoke that autistics has has been spoken to, to. and also it just like in in like autistics are considered a vulnerable population so just when your letter of consent isn't accessible when giving like volition isn't accessible is it really you're not really 100 percent being able to consent also and 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 also you are when you give feedback you are it is not welcome you do not get compensation you do not get anything for your time it is almost a form of coercion mixed with kind of like abuse mixed with, well, either this research gets done or none will get done or, well, but this is to benefit you. It's like, it sends very many confusing messages. I feel, I don't want to use big words like abuse. I'm not, I'm not saying this study is abusive, but I'm just saying that autistics have had like many, like have had past experiences of abuse statistically speaking. And so it's also quite easy to maybe manipulate them into actually doing this research when it provides nothing to you as an autistic person. So yeah. Yeah, and I've seen so many, so much tokenization happening um, related exactly to that. So let's jump um, to the last question really quickly before we um, address all of the great audience questions, because there's a lot and we only have 15 minutes. Um, so really quickly, the next question is, if you have a magic wand that could change what the autism research, you know, looks like to your vision, what would change? Um, what would autism research look like in your mag magical world? I'll just jump in really quickly that there needs to be a lot more um, community-based participatory research programs. Like I would say from my experience, the um, Aspire partnership has probably been doing the best work at incorporating autistic voices and, you know, creating programs and, you know, areas of research, you know, that are informed by autistic people and autistic community needs. Like, you know, there's always, 
room for growth. And I'll definitely say like Aspire's probably been doing the best work that I've in, I've encountered. Um, and I would also like to see more autistic researchers in support of affirming, you know, autism service systems. And I would really like there to be more than 2% um, lifespan, you know, funding on, you know, lifespan issues, maybe 3%, no, more than 3%, a lot. There needs to be a lot more. What do y'all think? Um, I would add quality of life to lifespan as well. Um, it's not just about, you know, getting to the end in some sort of state, but having, you know, the ability to have a life where you can thrive and love and be a human being and not constantly have to spend every last bit of extra energy you have battling systems that weren't built for you. Hey, um, hey guess what? Aspire's mm -hmm. doing exactly that right now. Well, yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, I think that uh, the other thing I would do if I had the magic wand you're proposing would be for the people who are the gatekeepers for publishing research. Um, thought of autism as not a problem for half of a percent of the population, but as an aspect of human nature that we don't understand very well and should talk about more. Um, that's my that's my little wish is that it wouldn't be considered such a niche, um, isolated topic for very few people to care about. Awesome, thank you, Elizabeth. KM, you wanna go since you're unmuted? Um, no, I don't have anything particular to say. I think it's all been echoed or said. Awesome. Elisa, I saw you um, unmuted yourself. I just noted that I'd forgotten to remute myself after the last time I talked. Cool. Morgan, what about you? Um, yeah, I think I would, I think I would like to see research that is based on more like thorough community needs assessments of autistic people in terms of how autistic people are defining what problems are and, and like where their priorities are and not have the research be defined by non-autistic people who um, decided that they wanted to fund a bunch of research on genetic studies for some reason, because that's what was interesting to them. Um, so yeah, I think just like really having it grounded in like community priorities, um, like as like an ethical like principle behind like where funding is coming from, like that's what I, what I would really like to see like in terms of like what gets funded and like having like the, the funding priorities being based on on like community needs assessments instead of on somebody else's ideas. So, yeah. And directly linked to that, um, Tanya St. John asked a question earlier, what are the top research priorities for one, autistic adults and two, autistic children from your points of view? Um, Oh, it's hard to really know that. I wish there could be research asking that. Maybe there already has been, but um, since I've left UW, I haven't found, I haven't been able to access the research databases or find any. Do any of you know? I mean, I'll, I'll say for autistic adults, at least, like what I've heard from, like I interact with you know, at least 100 or so autistic people a month um, through various ways. And most do want more research on, um, on like lifespan issues and, um, you know, addressing like domestic violence or suicide or, um, you know, homelessness or like autoimmune conditions, especially, which I think was um, KM spoke about earlier with Ehlers down those. There's a lot of autistic people with like mast cell activation syndrome, for example, or, um, a, a lot of other autoimmune conditions. And so for me, you know, I would also add, like, I think there needs to be more research on combining, like, looking at, like, how does the minority stress model, um, you know, experience what autistic people, you know, explain what autistic people are experiencing. And the study I linked a little earlier goes a little more into that, but that's one area I'd love to see more research on. For autistic children, I'm not sure. A lot of them are usually in like really um, unsupportive ableist environments. And so the ones I've talked to honestly do want research to like cure or remove their autism because a lot of them don't realize that there can be, you know, a better world for them or more supportive environments. Um, 
So that, yeah, definitely wanted to name that. What about the rest of y'all? Well, I mean, there is definitely a desire um, for autistic, like autistics do desire um, to be part of any research process or just be either consult on, either be part of the research team in itself. And I think there is, there, there we need to like just move away from interventions geared towards autistics, some uh, cure for autism and just co-training skills and, and understanding between autistics and neurotypical, co-producing studies with autistics and neurotypicals, et cetera. So I feel like I, I at least that's what I feel has been um, a need or um, a wish of those at least involved in research, in autism research, and would like to be involved further. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, do any, thanks, KM. Do any of you have anything to add before we jump to the next question? No. Okay, cool. Um, let me see. Let's Sorry, see. I, mm -hmm. I threw a few articles into the chat. What the first, am I the curriculum is on a somewhat similar note to academic activist or advocate, um, but also related to the experience of taking the class. And then the second two were about research priorities because studies on that do exist. Awesome. Oh, I can't wait to read those. Um, cool. So let's see what some of the other questions are. Um, hmm. So is there a way to find a research journal or website that's run by autistic people for the autistic community? Um, Neuroclastic um, or Thinking Person's Guide to Autism are probably the ones I look at the most. Um, for positive community research, um, Autism and Adulthood was mentioned, and that's probably been the best one um, that I've run across. I'm sure there's others. Do any of you know of others? Great, well then there definitely should be more. <laughs> um, let's see, we've addressed some of the other questions. Yeah, are there, um, I know there was one a little earlier about um, critical autism research. Um, I, and since I was disconnected earlier, I don't see that question. Um, do any of you have anything you wanna say on critical autism research or even like what it is and how it can, you know, con contribute to existing research? Okay, yeah, so the question, do you feel there are ways that autism research can draw upon critical disability studies? Yes, I think there are so many ways and I think I think the biggest things are, you know, breaking down earlier what we talked about on, um, you know, seeing like neurotypical researchers as unbiased um, and bringing no, um, like not bringing in any previous essentially like baggage into their current research or having it impact their current research. So I think that um, looking at like how positionality impacts how the research is done. Um, I think is critical and something that like critical autism research could bring in. Um, so critical disability studies, and this is something I read about a lot when I was in grad schools, so like five years ago. Um, it's essentially, I mean, so it's in a lot of ways like postmodern in aspect in that it essentially breaks down the existing structures and analyzes them and looks at like, what are the power dynamics in these structures? How are decisions actually made? How, you know, does privilege or oppression impact, you know, these decisions or, you know, these institutions? Um, and what are the roles that people actually exist under and perform rather than the roles that people say they're doing, if that makes sense? Um, yeah, so it looks like we've addressed um, the questions that were written. Um, oh, Morgan, hello. Yeah, I guess speaking to that a little bit, I feel like that is something that 
so very little like autism research even sort of like considers um, the, I think which we, we've kind of touched on that before, but it's kind of strange sometimes reading articles where there's just this sort of, sometimes even this kind of assumption of like what an autistic person must be. And because they're autistic, therefore they're bad at this. And just, just a lot of kind of assumptions that get made um, in there that aren't always unpacked. And um, yeah, I, I think that that, yeah. Right, and it leads like directly to dehumanization. Um, and I've seen it exist in like so many other like, min, you know, like discourse and literature about other like marginalized minority groups as well. Sorry to interrupt you. I was just like, ah. So one question, um, we also took audience questions from when they um, uh, sent in their, I don't know, at registrations. And one I want to um, ask is, you know, when you're looking at like, you know, like calls for, I don't know, autism research subjects or to, you know, go through a study yourself. Like, what are you looking for specifically in terms to like figure out, is this a good study or not? I think for me, like if I see just like an abundance of puzzle pieces, um, you know, on the website or, you know, flyer, I'm just going to be like, no, hell no. If it uses like person first language like in me I will give a much more critical eye to the rest of um what the research you know like what's being spoken and talked about I'm going to be looking at um you know has this research been co-designed with autistic people um you know like what are the other like articles that the um you know main investigators have um published you know what is this research actually trying to do versus what is being said it's trying to do. Um, yeah, what about the rest of y'all? Oh, and if it pays. Personally, I'm definitely looking at um, how they're defining autism. Um, it, are we the control, no, the experimental group? And is the control group deemed normal, healthy? Are we just the opposite of normal, healthy? Um, the goals, obviously. And even when they say there are no direct benefits, what is the purpose of it? Sometimes, you know, looking at funding, looking at certain elements, you, you, you get a picture of what kind of driving this research, but I definitely want to know like how it's going to apply, like just the applications and then just what kind of findings you're looking to get um, and how that would be framed uh, in regards to autistic participants. Um, one thing that I do if it's one where they say contact, like some of them, they want you to contact the researcher and then they'll give you the link or set up whatever. I will ask, how, I will say that I'm autistic and then ask for them to explain it to me like they're explaining it to a fellow researcher because I also am one. And the first hurdle is, do they do it? It's not even, what feel it's are they prepared to treat an autistic researcher as both as occupying both categories because if they are not then nothing else is going to be trustworthy um also of course looking for language cues not just person first if they're trying to use neurodiversity language but they're clearly doing it wrong for example if they're referring to individual people as neurodiverse this is another red flag of okay you're using the language because you first because you figured out that using it will get you more credibility with the people you're trying to recruit but you're doing it wrong. So you don't actually understand it or why. Nope, that's that's concerning. And then like I, one thing I'll also add is like, 
it's like I do a lot of what Alyssa, you know, says. I will also ask all of my best autistic friends if they've, you know, done the study and what their experience has been. And then I, I keep lists essentially of who, you know, what studies have had good experiences, like what authors typically have produced like the most autistic friendly research. And I, you know, file that away for the future, just to keep in mind. Is there anything y'all want to add before we uh, close out the webinar? Cool. All right. Well, I just wanted to thank you all so much for um, being here. Y'all had a lot of um, really, really wonderful things to say. Um, and it has been, um, it's just, I mean, I've been thinking about this stuff for like 10, 15 years. And it's like what some of what y'all said really, um, like was re seemed like really new and important and um you know stuff i'm definitely going to be thinking a lot more about um and morgan and elizabeth i also want to especially thank the two of you for um, agreeing to participate on this panel with less than uh 24 hours noticed when um the other panelists were sick unfortunately um yeah and also thank you to the audience for being here i really hope that this um you know can create change and you know if you have any questions um you know follow-up questions for any of the panelists feel free to email me um my i'm gonna post my email in chat um i saw a question um about the recording um so you typically what we do is we just um we go through make sure that the uh, transcript is accurate and actually says what we're saying um that typically takes about a week so um once that's done i i'll pr i'll try to send this to y'all um by like next thursday um so keep an eye out for the link um and you know the the recording will be free to send to anyone else you wish so you know send this out to the world we want to make sure that the learning happens everywhere we can so yeah i hope y'all um Take care of yourselves and um, be well. And until the next panel, take care. <laughs>